Let us consider deterrence and other behaviors of statecraft. A very important dimension of power is its fungibility. This is the ability to translate power from one issue area to another issue area. Power, especially military power, tends not to be very fungible. If you think about using military coercion in a technical issue, for example, using nuclear weapons to compel another country to change the way that they wire uh, electronic funds, it's completely disproportionate. And just by the act of exercising the military power, you will alienate the other target that you're negotiating with. Now, there are those that argue power, in fact, even military power is fungible because first of all, of issue, language, uh, issue linkage. Power is fungible because states interact simultaneously in many different issue areas and can therefore make trade-offs between different issue areas, such as security, health, trade, and communications. So that in Canada's relationship to the US, Canada contributes less to alliance organizations like NATO proportionally than the US does, but we give the US other benefits such as trade, which uh, for the US is a fair uh, trade-off. We do less in one issue area, but we do more in another issue area. Another reason power is fungible is because of spillover. Advantages in one instrument of power, particularly security, give states enforcement and credibility advantages in other issue areas. You're more likely to want to negotiate with a country that has a pow the power to survive. So you're more likely to, to uh, uh, invest your limited funds in a bank in the US. Because the US is so powerful, it could physically guarantee that your funds uh, will uh, not, uh, uh, not be uh, destroyed by, say, a foreign attack. So you can see down below representation of Japan's economic power, which it uses to trade off with the US in terms of security. So the US essentially provides much of Japan's security, and then Japan uh, participates in the global capitalist trading system with the US. Economic sanctions, embargoes, and blockades are a very common instrument in international relations. But we have a puzzle, which is why do they so often fail? Now, states tend to resist sanctions easily for two reasons. One, states can shift the burden of whatever is being sanctioned to disenfranchised groups within their society. For example, during the U.S. sanctioning of Iraq in the 1990s, Saddam Hussein was able to protect his power base around Tikrit and shift the sanctions onto the Shia, who had less access to power within the state. The second reason is broken down into two subcategories. First, societies generally believe that once a territorial concession is made, then it'll be irreversible and the country will never get that piece of territory back. Serbia resisted giving up Kosovo in the 1990s precisely because they thought once they gave up the territory, they would never get it back. Also, there's the belief that one concession could trigger further demands because a concession right away signals that a state is weak. So we have here the fear of accumulation or the fact that Concessions can be cumulative. So states will very aggressively defend the very first territorial sanction, knowing that it'll probably lead to further demands. So sanctions work best for minor policies. Most leaders, when they undertake a policy and they anticipate sanctions, have already prepared to do uh, well under those sanctions, to resist them. And sanctions are almost always automatic between countries that are adversaries because it signals displeasure and the states want to deny each other any possible trade benefits. Now the underlying logic is that for any instrument, it has to be compared to the difficulty of what is being requested. Obviously, uh, 
sanctions will fail if they're being applied to achieve very, very difficult goals. And sanctions won't be attempted for very easy goals because the country that's the target of the sanction would have already anticipated it. So we end up with this measurement outcome that sanctions rarely succeed. And we've seen, the, the, for example, the U.S. sanctions on Iran, which are uh, contemporary, and the decades-long U.S. sanction of Cuba uh, that was repealed uh, recently. So let's take a look at the applications of the sanctions. Well, there are some achievements. The active application of sanctions led to the cancellation of South Korea's nuclear weapons program uh, in the 1970s. South Korea decided to develop nuclear weapons because it feared the U.S. was pulling out of East Asia after the U.S.'s humiliation in its defeat in Vietnam. The U.S. embargoed Holland at the end of the Second World War when Holland tried to recapture the Dust East, Dust, Dutch East Indies, what is today Indonesia, which was its colony that was occupied by Japan. Now, uh, these sanctions reinforced one group in Holland that were anti-colonial against the other group that were more traditional and wanted to reacquire the colony. So ultimately, the sanctions succeeded. Sometimes sanctions succeed by their implied threat, even before they're enacted. Europe's reluctance to criticize China's human rights record is deterred by the fear that China would cut off Europe from China's market. Israel's departure from the Sinai 1957 that it had recently conquered from Egypt was largely because they anticipated American economic sanctions. The German and Japanese nuclear weapons abstinence, the fact that they've not pursued nuclear weapons is probably because they would, uh, they anticipate that there would be sanctions against them if they decided to develop nuclear weapons. Of course, there are many sanctions failures. U.S. and U.N. sanctions of Saddam Hussein's Iraq failed. Uh, it failed to uh, curb Serbian policy in Kosovo. When Myanmar's military took over the government after an election, uh, they successfully resisted sanctions because of Chinese subsidy to the regime. There are also instances in which sanctions provoked war. The U.S. oil embargo of Japan in 1940 was largely the result of the Japanese occupying French Indochina, a colony of France, while Germany was occupying France. And the Japanese realized they only had about 18 months of fuel left. And so if they're going to fight a war, they'd better fight it sooner rather than later. And shortly thereafter, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. There are also blockades that provoked war. The British commercial blockade of American shipping in the Atlantic led to the War of 1812. The German blockade by submarine of U.S. commerce in the Atlantic in 1917 led to the U.S. entry into World War I. The German interference with Brazilian maritime commerce in the Atlantic led ultimately to Brazil to enter uh, World War II in 1942, including deploying its army operating in Italy, along with the uh, British, Americans, and Canadians against the Germans. You can see on the bottom right the burning of the White House, which was uh, the culmination of the War of 1812. So let's consider now the four functions of force. The first is defense. This is the threatened or active use of force to increase a state's power or security either by protecting a state against conquest or securing external objectives. The example you can see here is Finland's 1939 to 1940 defense against Soviet invasion. Here you can see an example of attack for territorial conquest. This is Argentina's 1982 conquest of Las Malvinas, the Falkland Islands, under their president, General Galtieri. Military force can also be applied to destroy the enemy's military force, not territorial conquest. Here you can see the forces of the U.S. and its allies in 1991 moving into Iraq and Kuwait, destroying the Iraqi forces, but then pulling out. There was no territorial claim. States sometimes use force preemptively. A preemptive attack or preemptive war is where one side has a first strike advantage. 
This can typically be because when one country is about to attack another, it'll take its forces out of entrenchments and put them on a road, essentially undefended. And so the other country, if it attacks first, is going to catch those vulnerable forces out in the open on the road, and it'll be easier to destroy them. An example of a preemptive attack is the 1971 Indo-Pakistan War. Pakistan was alerted that India would attack East Pakistan, what is today Bangladesh, within 48 hours. And so the Indian uh, air bases were struck by the Pakistani Air Force just before the attack began. A second type of attack is the preventative attack or the preventative war. This is when an attack is conducted before the general balance of forces between, it, between the two countries moves against one of the countries. For example, in 1956, Israel was conducting retaliatory ground attacks against Palestinian Fedayeen that were conducting raids against Israeli territory, and they were doing it from bases in the Gaza. So the Israelis were conducting these attacks and Egypt wanted to deter the attack, so Egypt purchased a large number of weapons from Czechoslovakia, which was then in the, war, in the uh, East Bloc. So the Soviet Union essentially gave its approval. While Egypt was preparing to learn how to use the Soviet equipment, Israel was calculating that over time they would get weaker. So Israel needed to move first. So before Egypt had assimilated the military equipment into its military, Israel attacked, invaded the Sinai, destroyed the Egyptian army, and destroyed much of its equipment. Therefore, aggressors, the countries that want to change the current prevailing order, are not always those states that attack first. Sometimes the defender can be lured into attacking first. A classic example is the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Prussian Chancellor Bismarck needed an environment in which he could compel the other states of Germany, of which there were many, because this is before Germany was unified, he needed an environment that would cause them to come together to fight, and also an environment where France would not get any allies. And so Bismarck needed France to attack first. So there was the publication of the Ems Telegram, which basically insulted the honor of France, and this led to demonstrations in the streets of France calling for war. And uh, it pushed Napoleon III, the leader of France, to declare war enthusiastically. So Prussia looked like it was the defending party. Uh, in fact, Prussia used the opportunity immediately to attack, which they did. They uh, annihilated the French army, got to Paris, surrounded Paris isolated it into submission, and so the French then surrendered, and then Germany unified shortly thereafter. A major consideration in aggressive conquest is, of course, the cost of occupation. In an age of nationalism, where people are more easily mobilized than they were in the past, uh, and with communications equipment that allows people to coordinate their actions, uh, the cost of occupation can be very high. The British occupation of Northern Ireland in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s was quite costly. The Spanish uh, incorporation of the Basques and their fight with, the, with ETA, the Basque Revolutionary Movement. The French occupation of Brittany and Corsica occasionally raise issues. The occupation by the Soviet Union of Eastern Europe was difficult. Uh, there was the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. There was the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia in 1968. You had the Solidarity Union Movement in Poland. The Chinese occupation of Hong Kong produces issues. There's a great many uh, variables that have a role to play, whether the resistance is urban or whether it's rural, whether the occupying country is democratic or whether it's authoritarian. Uh, whether the occupation is by people from the same culture or from a very different culture. But this is a major factor that may reduce the costs of occupation. But it should be pointed out that with a ruthless country, during the Second World War, German Nazi occupation of France was such that the Germans got a profit. In other words, the French, working in their factories, produced more goods for Germany than Germany had to pay to occupy France. 
and there was a similar story for German occupation of other countries across Europe. So with a sufficiently ruthless government, uh, it is possible to make occupation cost-effective. The second function of force is deterrence. This is the threat of punishment or costs designed to deter an opponent from making an offensive move. Normally countries have as their priority defense over deterrence, but that's not always true. Deterrence theory is a theory that predicts peace. The goal, policy-wise, is to keep a war from happening and not necessarily to win it. During the Cold War, the U.S. put a high priority on deterrence to protect its allies in Europe and in the Far East. Currently, NATO is deployed in the Baltic states, including Canadian forces, to deter any move by the Russians against those three Baltic states. Now, rational deterrence theory is a theory that estimates when deterrence succeeds or fails. Rational choice, which is the belief that you can isolate a decision maker down to a few simple set of assumptions, is generally parsimonious. In other words, it provides a lot of explanatory power with not a lot of variables. Rational deterrence theory has three necessary causes for it to succeed, for deterrence in effect to prevail. Number one, capability. The state must have enough force to inflict unacceptable damage on the enemy. It doesn't necessarily have to be stronger, but it must inflict sufficient cost. Below you can see the Israeli Air Force and tanks, the Makrava of the Israeli army. Israel is probably not stronger than Egypt. But in every war with Egypt, Israel was able to inflict severe damage on Egypt quickly enough that Egypt found it politically untenable to continue the war. If Egypt was able to persist and maintain their attacks over months and years against Israel, Israel couldn't possibly prevail. But Israel didn't have to. It had a, a deterrent strategy that could inflict significant short-term damage enough to make it politically unacceptable for the frontline Arab states to continue their hostilities. The second necessary condition is credibility. The enemy must believe that the state will use force. During the defense of West Germany by NATO during the Cold War, there was always the question of why would Americans or English or French or Belgians or Canadians fight to protect Germany? Well, one, one way to address the, the fear that there wouldn't be commitment was that these NATO allies deployed their forces not only in Germany, but all the way up to the East German frontier. If the Soviet Union invaded West Germany, the first troops they would encounter would be these other NATO countries, including the English and the Americans. So credibility is important because if you're not credibly going to deter the enemy, they're not going to be deterred. You might have enough power to deter, but if you're not willing to fight, then it effectively cancels out the capability. The third necessary condition of successful deterrence is communication. The deterrent threat must be communicated to the enemy or the enemy won't know and the deterrent policy will simply not work. So all three of these must be present. If even one of these are missing, then deterrence will not succeed. The failure to communicate explains the attack by North Korea on January 12, 1950 against South Korea. The U.S. had inadvertently excluded South Korea from a public description of what their deterrent area would be. And Kim Il-sung, the North Korean leader, went to visit the Chinese and the Soviet Union's leadership to get permission to attack, thinking that this was an internal affair among the Koreas and it wouldn't involve the Americans. Ultimately, the U.S. intervened with the United Nations and then engaged in a very long and costly war for three years. So local deterrence is when you deter attacks upon oneself. So it's a dyadic relationship. One country tries to deter another. A successful demonstration of local deterrence, at least since 1965, the independence of Singapore, 
uh, has been Singapore's defense. Singapore was expelled from Malaysia because it was seen as a socioeconomic threat. And so the island had invested far more than its neighbors in national security. So in a country with a population of 4.1 million, it has 61,000 soldiers, which after full mobilization increased to 275,000. Uh, it has the largest tanks of all of Southeast Asia and a high-tech air force larger than the combined totals of its neighbors, uh, plus a submarine force, marines, helicopters, rockets. Singapore's deterrent threat consists of a rapid mobilization and possible attack into its neighbors if it's threatened by invasion. There have been a couple of instances where it's been threatened by Indonesia directly for a payoff and then Singapore signaled by mobilizing its forces. Singapore gets most, if not all, of its fresh water from a pipeline from Malaysia. And Singapore feels it has an obligation to protect the 15% of the Malaysian population that are Chinese. So Malaysia initiated an unannounced military exercise in one instance, and Singapore managed to complete a partial mobilization in only 24 hours. So it indeed has uh, perhaps not the stamina for a long war, but uh, if it had a conflict with Malaysia, it could probably uh, penetrate into the peninsula about 100 kilometers before it was stopped. There are also cases of unsuccessful local deterrence. In 1967, Egyptian President Gamal Nasser deployed the Egyptian army in the Sinai in part to isolate Israel, which would have been disastrous for the Israelis because they depend on imports of food and fuel and to simultaneously deter an attack on Egypt, which was maintaining the blockade. The Israelis, however, attacked and ultimately occupied the Sinai. Here you can see the road going through the Mitla Pass, where an Egyptian column has been trapped and bombed by the Israeli Air Force. Now, the main difference between local and extended deterrence is that while in local deterrence, it's believable when a state claims to protect itself, there is, however, a credibility problem with respect to extended deterrence. When an ally is defended, the enemy may attack believing that the deterring, deterring state is not really serious about defending its ally. So we have the example of successful extended deterrence during the Cold War. The U.S. put an enormous amount of military effort in terms of around $100 billion a year investment to signal to the Soviet Union that the U.S. would act to protect West Germany against a Soviet invasion. And the Soviets seemingly believe this because the U.S. committed a lot of soldiers and military force in West Germany, as well as nuclear weapons, and trained extensively, indicating that if the Soviet Union were to invade West Germany, it could not but avoid end up uh, fighting the American soldiers, which made the deterrence more credible. A second famous case is uh, when the president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, invaded Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990. And he did this following and despite his meeting with U.S. Ambassador April, April Glaspie on July 23rd, 1990. And you can see here uh, Glaspie uh, in a picture uh, shortly after the meeting in the bottom right. Glaspie's famous statement that, quote, we have no opinion on the Arab-Arab conflicts like your border disagreement with Kuwait, close quote, was misinterpreted by Saddam Hussein that the U.S. would not act to protect Kuwait. So Saddam Hussein took this as an indication of uh, basically a, a permission to reshape the borders of the Middle East. Now, the U.S.'s diplomatic signaling, however, tends to be most often misunderstood because the U.S. doesn't bluster. It's not very aggressive in its diplomacy because it's uh, more often engaged in careful bargaining with very powerful states. And so the U.S. Uh, didn't clearly say to Saddam Hussein not to invade Kuwait, but the U.S.'s disposition and uh, April Glaspie's talk with Saddam Hussein um, gave the impression that the U.S. wasn't shifting policy. So it was a lack of communication. There is therefore a distinction to be made between two types of deterrence. 
most of what we've talked about so far is immediate deterrence. This is when one state seeks to actively deter a threat from another. Immediate deterrence failure is an attack by one state on the deterring state. Now, general deterrence failure is somewhat more difficult to observe and measure. This is when two states are not in a confrontation because one state is so much weaker that there's not really an opportunity for an active confrontation. Now, immediate deterrence can turn into general deterrence or vice versa as power levels change. For example, the U.S. and Mexican enduring rivalry. Despite occasional wars between Mexico and the U.S., the most recent being General Pershing's retaliatory attacks in 1915 along their common border after Pancho Villa led an attack into an American town and killed some American citizens. The U.S. Uh, invaded and destroyed some towns along the frontier. And before that, the 1846 Mexican-American War, where the Americans landed on the east coast of Mexico and then marched into Mexico City. Mexico's weaker position today makes it virtually impossible for Mexico to do anything but be passive. So Mexico today does not invest in a large military or a large air force or a large navy and does not even consider deploying intelligence assets uh, or weapons against the U.S. because of general deterrent success. The U.S. is so powerful that Mexico does not even have a, 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 a small chance of a successful confrontation over a dispute. Now, putting it in perspective, uh, things can change. If there was a nuclear war between the U.S. and the USSR and the U.S. was substantially uh, destroyed in a nuclear strike, Mexico would then be in a much stronger position relative to the U.S. and might try to redress some of its losses. General deterrence matters because most nuclear weapons are designed for general deterrence, not immediate deterrence. To destroy Russia today or the Soviet Union, in terms of its uh, industry and its cities, probably only took about 500 nuclear weapons. But the U.S. had thousands more. The thousands of nuclear weapons are not meant to stop a war. You're going to kill uh, about a third of the population just with 500 nuclear weapons. The additional weapons were meant to signal the country's commitment to having military power. And with that many nuclear weapons, it was simply impossible to catch up to the U.S. Between 1959 and 1961, the U.S. manufactured one thermonuclear warhead every 55 minutes. So you can imagine in just two or three weeks, it would have more weapons than France, and then another few weeks it would have more uh, nuclear weapons than um, the U.K., and then a few more weeks, and it would have more nuclear weapons than every other country like South Africa, Israel, India, Pakistan. So the U.S. was so far ahead in terms of warheads, uh, there was simply no opportunity for other countries to even compete. So that's the logic of general deterrence. General deterrence failure is when a country falls behind and it leads to the beginning of a confrontation. And we can see that emerging in perhaps the uh, emerging hostility between China and Taiwan. So what are some of the criticisms of rational deterrence theory? Well, there's been a lively debate since the 1970s on the usefulness and correctness of deterrence theory using both statistical and case study methods. And so there's a number of issues that uh, need to be addressed. First of all, there's no way to tell whether one state did not attack another because it was successfully deterred or because it simply didn't want to attack. So with deterrence theory, we, we must always compare the explanation with probable alternative explanations to be certain. To solve this, we can use counterfactual analysis. Would the Soviet Union have attacked West Germany if NATO had never been created? Obviously, this is a different, difficult problem uh, to solve. Counterfactuals have a lot of pitfalls that we need to address, make sure they're co-tenable with reality. But this is an application of counterfactuals. A second criticism is that deterrence does not explain many important cases of deterrence failure because it cannot explain risk-taking, specifically irrational decision-makers. For example, in 1904-1905, Japan, which was then in the process of industrializing, attacked Russia and established large military power. 
Russia had more available military forces and resources. Russia demonstrated its willingness to be involved in very large wars. Uh, for example, Russia was instrumental in defeating Napoleon at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Russia had warned Japan against too much encroachment in China. But Japan, feeling that if it didn't stand up to Russia in Korea and China, it would forever be a minor country, chose to attack. So it attacked the Soviet, the rather the Russian fleet in Port Arthur, which can be seen in the map on the left, uh, and advanced an army uh, into Korea to confront the Russian uh, forces in uh, Manchuria. So in 1904, Japan assaulted the Russian base at Port Arthur and then destroyed the Russian relief fleet at Tsushima in 1905, causing the Russians to sue for peace before the Russian mobilization for, for war was ready. If the Russians had decided to commit to the mobilization, the army would have been large enough coming down the Trans-Siberian Railway that it would have eventually destroyed the Japanese army in Manchuria. In 1941, Japan had the same uh, set of choices. The US embargoed Japan's oil because Japan was slowly occupying the coastal areas of China. And so China had a choice, either it pull out of China or it'd go to war. So China risked going to war. The U.S. economy was seven times larger than Japan. The U.S. had almost twice the population of Japan. So the Japanese calculated that other things being equal, they would probably lose the war. But they thought there was a possibility that made the gamble worthwhile that they could win. In 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, crippling the U.S. fleet, and then sought a major battle to destroy the remainder of the U.S. fleet. But the U.S. never, never gave Japan the opportunity. At the Battle of Midway in 1942, the U.S. decisively defeated the Japanese fleet by sinking four major fleet carriers. And after that, Japan lost the initiative, and it was just a matter of time before they were isolated and surrendered. The third function of force is compellence, which is the threat or use of punishment to force an opponent to reverse a previously taken action. There are two variants. The first is peaceful compellence. This is the threatened use of force that causes the adversary to reverse their previous action. In the lead up to both World War I and World War II, the Soviet Union and England invaded Iran because it was a very convenient way of, sh of moving supplies to the Soviet war effort. At the end of the war, 1946, the British withdrew, but the Soviet Union remained in the north, uh, particularly because they had a Soviet Socialist Republic that was Azerbaijan, and there was a significant Azeri community that lived across the border in northern Iran. And the Soviets pondered remaining there to incorporate it into the Soviet Union. There resulted, of course, a civil war, with the Azeris backed by the Soviets and the Persians fighting to reincorporate it. Uh, U.S. President Truman essentially coerced the Soviets by telling them, you must leave. And the Soviets took the signal as a U.S. nuclear armed states threatening the Soviet Union to leave. And ultimately, the Soviets withdrew and the Persians were able to reestablish control of the Azeri portion of Iran. There is also physical compellence. This is the infliction of costs until the adversary reverses their previous action. And this was the logic applied to NATO's bombing of Serbia over the treatment of the Kosovars by the Serbian army. And the constant bombing in conjunction with a threat of a land attack ultimately led to a concession by the Serbians. Now, compellence is a punishment strategy. It raises the costs or the risks to the civilian population, particularly in terms of deaths, or the killing of military personnel to exploit the casualty sensitivity of opponents. Now, in fact, conventional bombing has never worked on its own. Conquest has always been faster. If you look at the Japanese bombings of China in the 1930s and 40s, German bombings of Holland in 1940, Allied bombings of Germany and Japan during the Second World War, uh, 
the German use of rockets against London, the Israeli bombing of Egypt during the War of Attrition, 1969 to 1970, the exchange of rockets between Iran and Iraq during the, uh, the Gulf War, or the Israeli bombing of Lebanon in 2006. Bombing essentially never works for the same reason that sanctions work, which is that if it's over a serious policy issue to do with territoriality, the citizens will never concede because if they concede now, they're going to be confronted later on. Uh, and for minor issues, typically leaders have already calculated and anticipated the bombing and conformed. For example, during the Second World War, Hungary, not wanting to be bombed, cut a secret deal with the American Air Force that Hungarian anti-aircraft fire will not shoot at U.S. bombers flying over Hungary, and in exchange, the Americans won't bomb Hungary. When the Germans found out, of course, they reversed the policy. But the Hungarians had already calculated that they didn't want to be bombed, and so they conceded beforehand, and therefore there was no need to bomb them. The fourth function of force is swaggering. This applies to shows of force not associated with the above categories, and it's typically associated with establishing reputations of capability. And we see this in arms races, for example. Argentina and Brazil in the 1970s and 1980s uh, both invested in their aircraft carriers, their navies, and their nuclear weapons programs largely to build up their reputations. As soon as the regimes were replaced and civilianized in the early 1990s, both nuclear weapons programs were canceled and Argentina mothballed their aircraft carrier, showing you that a lot of the swaggering comes from perhaps the domestic need of a regime uh, to demonstrate its, its uh, reputation. The English and French had loaned money to Argentina in the 1830s, and Argentina didn't pay, and the English and the French deployed their naval forces uh, this is a form of swaggering because they wanted to intimidate Argentina without actually doing any, anything uh, to pay back their loans. Ultimately, the Argentinians didn't, and the British landed Marines in Buenos Aires and were faced with a general uprising, and the British Marines were defeated and chased out of Buenos Aires. So clearly, uh, swaggering sometimes has its risks. The Argentinian reputation to be independent was stronger than the British reputation uh, for extracting uh, debts uh, 